<laughs> nope. Nope. <laughs> I was going to say, that's not right. It was December the 5th, 2022. Um, the select board, we're, we're meeting. Uh, to, most of this meeting will be a public meeting to address ARPA, but we'll be getting that after the, um, some of the direct business that we have. So the first item on the agenda is to approve the agenda. Do we have a motion to approve the agenda? I move that we approve the agenda. It's written. A second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion on the agenda? Yes. I'm sorry. Yeah, Chris? I'd add one topic, if I could, brief topic. OK. It's kind of a more of a question than a conversation, <laughs> I guess, at this time uh, about uh, school board. At the end? Don't care. Yeah, let's, let's after let's, ARPA. Let's Before keep that ARPA. after the ARPA, OK? <laughs> Okay, are there any, is there any other discussion on the agenda? There being none, uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? <coughs> any abstentions? Motion carries. Next item on the agenda is the consent agenda item is uh, uh, minute meetings and approval of the third class li license for CHCM CM LLC formerly Cold Hollow Cider Mill. Make a motion to approve consent agenda items. I'll second. Thank you. Second. Second. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion on the agenda, on the uh, consent agenda items? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Now, now is the time on the agenda that we uh, will take input from the public. This is not on the ARPA, because I know many of you may be here for the ARPA discussion, but if, you have, if folks have any other brief items that they want to bring up to the select board, now is the time. Skip. Not wanting the opportunity to pass. <laughs> um, just a brief update on the employee appreciation and thank you to Bill Breakfast there. Um, it's set for next Wednesday at uh, 8 o'clock at St. Leo's. I was disappointed to hear that Danny and Alyssa aren't going to be able to make it. I did try to change it to Thursday, but St. Leo's was occupied that day. Roger and Tom have graciously volunteered for the Pancrate crew beginning at 6. And I'm going to be assigning Chris an assignment here uh, shortly and things. So uh, it's on and you're welcome to, there's a lot of setup and things to do that if you uh, have time before 8. Yeah, I think Danny and I both can also be there at 6 till yeah, 8.30. We'll be there. I've okay. had a work meeting for three months, so I wasn't able to move it. I don't but, think uh, either of you have been to one of them before. No, you? COVID. So I was going to assign Natalie kind of be in charge of kind of the setup while I got the pancakes and the other things started so she knows. And I'll have everything there before 6. So whenever you get there, It'll be fine, and sorry that um, you're not going to be able to. Yeah, Yeah. next time, just for future planning, if you just check first before, you know, check with the board, because I'd love to be there. It's literally the only yeah. day of the week. So just um, for future planning, because I, I definitely want to be involved. You know, it was kind of, I wanted to do it in St. Leo's, and that mm -hmm. was kind of the thing you're on fight. So thank you all. Skip, mm -hmm. I hope it's a good event. Sorry I couldn't be there, but I'd much rather be doing the pancakes and uh, cleaning out my mom's apartment. I do appreciate <laughs> Understand. That. Thanks. Um, can oh, I just say pop it? Did you not get the invitation to the uh, town municipal workers? Pardon? Uh, the pancakes are for whom? The town employees. Is town employees. Time? Right. Yeah. Here. I, I just wonder how you're getting word out. And this is the first I've heard of it. They're going out tomorrow. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> get out of this this, this is the preview. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's that's that too many Christmas trees and meetings. Okay. <laughs> Alyssa, you had a question? Um, just on public um, form, I wanted to thank and acknowledge everyone who was involved in the River of Lights 
celebration on Saturday, um, including both the town rec staff and town general staff who helped out with the logistics. Um, I know MK put a really nice post on Front Porch Forum today, but also MK, Don, uh, Sara Lee, and everyone who made it happen. So. Always a wonderful life, brings the Christmas spirit to the, the, the town. And especially after two years of COVID, it's kind of a welcome thing to have. Thanks, Alyssa. Any other uh, comments from the public? If not, we'll move on to the main agenda. <coughs> Select board items. Uh, update on the grant application for 2023 Vermont Fruits and Nut Tree Program. Steve? Okay, I'm the tree guy tonight. <laughs> You're the fruits and nut guy. The fruit and nut guy, yeah. We're mainly gonna talk <coughs> about fruit. So this is the project that I brought to you at your meeting on November 21st, so there's the few maps. I've got a little more detail tonight. Are these the same maps that you have um, before? Well, I've got an additional one. That, um, let's see. No, Karen. Here's one for Karen. Turn that down. Thank you. All right. So um, this, we're all set? Oh, good. So uh, <laughs> this is a grant program. It's a new program, and it's a collaboration between the Vermont Garden Network and the Vermont Urban and Community Forestry Program. Uh, the Urban and Community Forest Program is the one that we've applied for for many years for street tree plantings, plantings in the cemetery and the parks. So this is a new program. It's uh, geared to fruit and nut trees. And um, we're proposing to plant eight fruit trees and uh, this map that is the detailed one on the other side there, Danny, um, shows the location. So uh, this one shows the community gardens north, which um, is right behind this building. It's the old community gardens. There's still 12 plots there. And the area beyond the garden plots is um, underutilized. Uh, we brush hog it and uh, think, uh, a pollinator group did some uh, pollinator planting back there of annuals. So we'd like to put um, the fruit trees uh, along the, uh, about 15 feet back from the top of the bank. Uh, it's a good sunny location. Um, <clears throat> they'd be about 20 feet apart. And we'd like to plant a combination of apples and pears and possibly plums. Uh, this is a collaborative project with the recreation program. The, uh, this particular grant program is geared to planting fruit and nut trees in conjunction with community gardens. And the goal is to provide fruit for people who are underserved, in general, low and moderate income people, or at least have that as part of the program. So the idea is that we would involve the recreation program kids in getting the trees planted, watered, mulched, established, and then within a couple of years when we start getting fruit, uh, they can do uh, the picking, the fruit can go to their families, perhaps to the uh, food shelf, the senior center, and, um, and then any excess we make available to the broader community. So it's a pilot program. We try it, see how it goes. I think it's a good site for fruit trees. And um, yeah, so that's, that's it in a nutshell, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't resist that one. Can't wait to see it blossom. Yeah. So the budget, I'll, let me just tell you about the budget and Roger will get to your question. So the grant um, is from, uh, we can apply from $500 to $1,000. Uh, the trees, we'd like to plant uh, potted fruit trees. Uh, they're available in, from a number of local sources. They cost about $75 to $80 a piece for a tree that's uh, you know pretty decent size, six to eight foot tree. And uh, they'll start bearing within a, a couple years usually. So we're looking for a grant of up to about $750. So we'll, we'll buy the trees, we may not apply for quite that much, but I was thinking if you could authorize up to um, $750, then we'll also get the tree guards, the plastic tree guards to keep the mice and stuff <coughs> from chewing the trunks and uh, deer, and then uh, some soil amendments and, 
and mulch, and that would be about it. So, did you have a question, Roger? I did. Uh, I just wanted to uh, make sure that you were planning to get uh, disease-resistant varieties, because uh, apple trees are some of the most heavily sprayed uh, agricultural pro uh, uh, products out there, um, you know, in commercial settings. Yeah, yeah, definitely. We'll focus on disease-resistant trees, and uh, we're not planning on spraying a bunch of chemicals. We'll do dormant yeah, oil and um, you know some preventative. Out maintenance and that sort of thing, pick up the drops at the end of the season. So that's the way. I like to do fruit trees, and I think that would be the intention to make it compatible with the organic gardens and so on, the people who do organic gardens. So you're doing the harvest as well for the participants as well as the food shelf? Right. That, that would be the goal, is we'd make um, fruit available to the food shelf. But um, the main focus is going to be the recreation program. So okay. in the summer, it would, we'd have a, one of the recreation groups would be assigned to keep the trees watered, to get them established, and keep them mulched, and so on. And then uh, in the fall, we've got the after-school rec program, so they could be involved in terms of um, uh, picking that happens after school starts basically after the summer rec program's over and uh, so we'll keep some of those kids involved uh, through the fall yeah. that's the plan if you need help i'd be glad because i have pretty extensive background in both orchard and vineyard work great well we'll tap everybody's experience okay yeah definitely so what we'd be looking for is authorization um, for the manager to um, apply, sign, if you will. We don't necessarily need a signature, but to apply for um, up to uh, $750 for the fruit tree planting under the Vermont Garden Network uh, grant program. So moved. Is there any further discussion? Oh, okay. I'll second. Yeah. <laughs> we'll move and second. Now we'll go into the city. Is there any further discussion? Steve, the if it yeah. goes well, there's opportunity in future years to apply for more funding and grow the program, so to speak. Well, I don't, <clears throat> I don't know if the, if this program will be repeated. Mm -hmm. It may, but um, if it's not, it's not a lot of money. We could budget funding mm -hmm. yeah. to do subsequent plantings. I think we want to make sure that it's a manageable project. Mm -hmm. It's real. This is really a pilot. See how it mm -hmm. goes. But there's plenty of space there to do other plantings, other pollinator kind of plantings as well. Cool. Yeah. So hopefully it'll take. Yeah. Great. Any other discussion? <laughs> there being none, we'll vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 <coughs> Any opposed? Any abstention? Motion carries. OK, thank you. Thanks. Keep you posted. Thank you, Steve. Sounds sure. like a great project. Yeah. Mm -hmm. OK. Now we come to the uh, bulk of what we left plenty of time for people's input on the ARPA money. Uh, we have asked people via an electronic and mail mailing in survey, how would the town residents like to spend the $1.2 million? And we are working in a plan for how to spend on the survey. It does indicate some of the things that we have already uh, appropriated money for. Uh, ARPA funds, but there's still a significant amount of funds uh, for other projects. Uh, the existing projects are $100,000 for the ICE Center of Washington West that was approved by the voters at town meeting, $90,000 for the Highway Department approved by the voters as part of the 2002 budget, $50,000 for CV Fiber for, for providing uh, broadband internet to underserved addresses in Waterbury, and that was approved by the select board in April, and $76,000 was committed to the Waterbury Ambulance Service for the new station creation project, and uh, funding will be included in the 2023 budget. Oh, bless you. Uh, the process moving forward is we're looking for input. You know, we don't want to be a unilateral source, so that's one of the reasons why we asked the community to complete surveys. Uh, what tonight is, is we're, we're going to take what people's opinions are, 
but we will we are not going to like have a, a, a dialogue because there have been just so you know, I think it's over 450 completed surveys that we have already gotten, both electronically and by mail. So as much as your input here is equal to those, we're going to add the comments that we have here to those comments and then try to synthesize what the community is looking for for future projects other than the ones that I specifically said. So uh, I don't want to uh, belabor this. I would like to, uh, is there anyone, do we want to first go? I, yeah, Sorry. thanks. So um, in addition to the public comment, we're sort of considering the comment like the additional notes. So if you haven't filled out a survey, either on paper, there are some here or online, we'd love for you to do that in addition to the comments so that we can rank those as well. Um, and then there was some clarification, I think, on one of the categories. So I'd love for Tom to do that first, and then we'll I dive can do in. That. Do you want me to give a 30-second overview of the ARPA process in general, how we got to here? That'd be sure. great. That'd be great. So the, the real short version, um, and some of the surveys reflected this, is that uh, the million and a half that's been allocated to this town has to be spent. So if people are advising us to, to save it, uh, we can only save it for so long. Um, the funds have to be committed by the end of 2024 and have to be spent by the end of 2026. So this is uh, not funds that the town can keep in its back pocket forever. Um, so that's the, the short version of, of why we're here is that we have to spend this, these funds. We can't invest them. Um, so there was also a little bit of feedback from the public that I got uh, related to the gravel and the quarry question. Um, so by way of background, and Chris is more familiar with this, so he can correct me. Um, so we currently get our gravel from Bolton. Uh, so reasonably close. Uh, the road crew is pretty happy with the quality. Uh, the Bolton gravel pit, the owner has told us uh, they are no longer selling gravel. They will still sell sand, uh, but no gravel. Um, and our, our total budget for road materials, gravel, sand, mixtures, it's about $120,000 a year, and that varies, of course. Um, but about a third of that most years, 40000 or so, is, is just gravel in our budget. Um, so the issue is uh, in buying gravel from other sources, not so much the cost per ton, but the trucking cost, which is a huge part of that $40,000. Um, so we'll, in the short term, we'll be going a lot further to get gravel, or we'll be paying other people to go a lot further. So your 2023 budget will have an increased cost no matter what we do, and that's probably going to be the case for a few years. Um, we've got in our hands an engineering report from 1974, um, and, and Alec Tuscany and Woody have told me that the, uh, the data in that report, much of it really originated from when they built the highway. So that report identifies good gravel sites in the town, and the problem is since 1974, uh, a lot of those sites have houses on them now. Um, so they're just not available. Some of those sites are just not accessible. There's no road to them. Um, some obviously have environmental issues. But even if we had a perfect gravel site, which we don't, and even if the town owned that land, which it does not, we have an expensive multi-year permitting process in front of us. Um, there is also an older quarry on Sweet Road and my understanding is that, and the state owns it, my understanding is the state opened that quarry to build the highway. And I further believe the state has not used that quarry for a long, long time. So we don't have knowledge, direct knowledge right now about what is there, the quality of it, what's available. Um, but there's been some internal conversation about the town beginning the process of inquiring what's there, would the state ever sell it, what are the costs related to acquisition and operation. Uh, the other piece is that quarry is in uh, the watershed protection zone for uh, our utility district, for our water and sewer district, sorry, for the water piece of it. Um, and so given it's in the water protection zone, um, you can imagine the permitting requirements open a gravel pit, and in a water protection zone, they're even stricter. Um, 
So I think the thinking related to the, to the quarry and the gravel issue was related to this conundrum we find ourselves in. And I think in the short term, there's not a good answer aside from paying more. In the long term, maybe there is a better answer. Maybe it's not in Waterbury, maybe it's a neighboring town and not Morrisville, but closer than that. Is that, and, is that a good background, Chris? Yeah, if I could add a couple things to it, uh, I'd appreciate it. So Bolton's crushed gravel uh, at one point didn't pass state spec um, a number of years ago. But I think because of the lack of aggregate sources, uh, they eventually had to uh, qualify it simply because it was the only game in town. Years ago, um, after using that product myself for several times, uh, there's other quarry, stone quarries in Barrie, Berlin. Uh, those are crushed shale product. Um, Bolton is basically sand and cobblestone. Uh, very clean sand, so it doesn't have any binder in it. Uh, the shale product in Barry and Berlin is shale. It's, it's a soft rock. It packs like heck, uh, but it doesn't wear well, where the cobblestone rock is hard, and, uh, but it just doesn't have any compaction. So on a whim, I decided to try to mix the two together, load for load, combine the two, because they both, on their own, lacked what each other had. And I came up with a product that I called 50-50 mix. You know, 50% shale, 50% gravel. Uh, I did a project in Richmond, and uh, it had to be tested for compaction. And the guy from Vermont Testing came down with his apparatus. And uh, the first swing he took with the hammer, he said, I can tell you already, this is going to pass compaction. So the product that I created really uh, had some incredible compaction rate and uh, wore better than the shale on its own. Uh, so I started using that exclusively instead, unless somebody wanted the separate ones on their own. I did finally convince the town to start using that. And they've adopted that. And to this day, I think that's pretty much what they use on their back roads. Um, so Bolton's you know, getting rid of the crushed gravel. Uh, and other products, and from what I understand, they're boiling it down to just winter sand, which I'm in fear of that resource drying up at some point, too, and have discussed a little bit about what we could do to uh, maybe safeguard ourselves for the future. All the other quarries and pits are quite a distance out. <clears throat> and as Tom said, and we haven't felt that impact yet because we haven't been through a season where we've had to haul from you know, who knows where and back. Uh, diesel prices being what they are, uh, the cost of vehicles these days. Uh, you know, back when they were <clears throat> rebuilding this section of uh, Route 100 up through Waterbury Center, they were hauling aggregate all the way from Irisburg. Uh, yeah, it was, and to me that didn't make sense when we had local quarries that they could reopen to, to get that same aggregate. The problem with that is hauling large distances. Number one, if, if we're supposed to be uh, conscientious about greenhouse gases, you're, you're putting a lot more into the atmosphere hauling those long distances. Plus, those trucks are heavy when they're loaded. Uh, you're pounding the hell out of the roads. You know, Back when they were doing this Waterbury project, I said, we're, we're pounding the hell out of 40 miles of road to fix 10 miles of road. You know, it, it didn't make any sense. Uh, so there's that aspect that also plays into my thinking process when it, when it comes to this project. Now, I know there's some fears that maybe we can answer about having this quarry open. Back eight years ago, when I went to Act 250, Ed Stanick was in charge at the time. Uh, he basically handed me this project, this, this operation of that old quarry. Uh, I brought it to the select board back then, and they had no desire to look at it for fear of upsetting people who were walking and pedal biking up and down uh, 
sweet road in in the residents. But I think a lot of that, those problems can be solved. This is would be strict, strictly a town uh, quarry. It would be operated only seasonal, and it would be operated during work hours uh, and speed limits. I mean, I operate out of a gravel pit on Sweet Road. Uh, the owner of that pit, who's since passed, set a precedent with me, 25 miles an hour, and I refuse to exceed 25 miles an hour driving on that road. I'm very conscientious about driving on the back roads with my big truck. Um, so that's that's how we're where we're at. I was hoping to get a second bite of the apple on this uh, for fear of taxes being driven through the roof because we're having to haul aggregate from who knows where. Uh, in our, as we witnessed last spring, our back roads are in very terrible condition. Uh, and if we'd had this quarry back when it was handed to me at, at the, from the state, uh, we probably wouldn't have gone through the winter that we did. I did, ha at that time as well, talk, talk to two ge geologists who said that that aggregate or that rock in that quarry was some of the best that we could acquire for the use that we would need it for. So that also encouraged me uh, to, to you know, try to get a second bite of the apple on this. So that's kind of where I'm at on it. Thank you, Chris. I'm just curious where that state site is on Sweet Road? It's the old stone quarry across from uh, just down beyond the Hunger Mountain where they park for the Hunger Mountain Trail. Across, across from the quarry? I'm sorry, Monica. Across from the, the old quarry? No, it is the old quarry. Oh, it is the old quarry. Yeah, yeah. So Ed Stanick, Ed Stanick at the time told me, Chris, you can use this quarry without an Act 250 permit because it's under 10 acres. Now that property is that's in Forest and Parks is more than 10 acres, but I think he was referring to the quarry area itself was under is 10 the acres. Quarry stone and not correct. Yeah. Okay. What yeah. kind of stone is that? That I couldn't tell you, but the geologists, when I spoke to them, they said best stuff in the world, Chris, for what you'd want to use it for. Uh, and I talked to Fred McCullough, who owns McCullough Crushing back at that time, and he said, Chris, if you can get yourself, if your town of Waterbury could get themselves their own quarry, it'd be the best investment they ever made. Uh, and my, my objective here is not necessarily to purchase that. My objective is to lease it, if we could, at a very reasonable price. Uh, that would be our better approach. And, and, this and there's, a, there's enough residual, just rock laying around there that would probably serve this town for five years without even having to do any more, you know, blasting or anything like that. Just cleaning up what's the, what was left. So this, this whole, this, uh, this is the um, first time I've heard about a need for gravel. Um, <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, we always need gravel, but, um, but for the town to be making this sort of initiative. So I'm, I'm just want, I just want to be clear. It's the Bolton um, source that has stimulated this investigation? Uh, investigation? Yeah, the fact that it's drying up, yeah, is is what's prompted this. Okay. Yeah. Melissa. And I just want to clarify the stage we're at right now is we are seeking public input on a variety of different potential projects the town can work for. So Correct. thank you, Chris. Chris brings really deep expertise in this field and has raised this as a potential future concern for the town, which is why we included it on the survey with other potential future projects across a variety of areas. So just to anchor in tonight's conversation, recognizing that we are gathering input has, has been framed out. The input both from here tonight, from online, from the paper surveys will all be part of us considering what priorities may be and for whatever priorities may be, whether this becomes one or not, we recognize that there will be future outreach and conversation and budgeting. Again, just I want to anchor, like, no decisions have been made. This right. is one right. bucket, as we called them, of ideas. There's a couple of other buckets, and tonight is really just about seeking input. So thanks, everyone, for being here in person or online. Thanks, Alyssa. Thanks for holding it.
Maybe we'll go first to, we have a one written comment that uh, someone has that, Roger, if you could Yeah, read I'll read that. this uh, on behalf of Allison uh, Schleppi. Uh, Allison uh, came forward with another uh, resident from Little River Road uh, previously uh, concerned about uh, traffic and addressed the select board uh, this past summer. Uh, and this is a follow-up. So this is uh, on behalf of Allison. I am speaking on behalf of the residents of Little River Road. We have spoken in front of the select board several times to ask the town to dedicate funds to fix problems on our road. These problems include increased traffic, trucks hauling ever larger boats, cars, and trucks traveling at unsafe speeds, and the overwhelming dust that is created by all of the above on our unpaved road. All of these are related to the increased recreational use of our road, the boat launch, campground, and mountain biking trails in the state park. We believe that paving the residential section of the road and putting in speed bumps would go a long way to keeping the residents safe and visitors feeling welcome. We know that you are discussing how to use ARPA funds tonight and we are again asking the select board to use some of those funds or money from the town budget to help keep us all healthy and safe and to allow all uh, to enjoy the wonderful recreational resources that our road provides. Thank you. Would anyone else wish to come forward if they could uh, state your name and um, uh, address? in Waterbury, and uh, we would love to hear your comments. Skip, are you kind of... Well, I didn't know whether you were speaking to someone or you no, were, we're not inviting speaking. everyone to... No, we're <laughs> asking everyone in the audience and on Zoom lands. Well, if nobody is ready, I'll... If you could come forward. Thanks, Skip. Forward. Yeah, and sitting here just helps with folks on Zoom, just so everyone Right. Knows. Thanks. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, yes, thank you for holding the forum and seeking input and things. Um, I come here as a NEFUD commissioner in the unique position of having turned down $600,000 of your ARPA money. <laughs> Good <laughs> But bringing together what we think is a better project. So um, we just want to get it on your radar screen. It's a project that uh, EFUD has been working on for a couple of years. Bill Woodruff has put a lot of time in it. Um, it's a waterline extension from over to the town shed, over to Route 100 by the Cabot Annex, cross country for an uh, eight inch line. Um, we started the idea, there were some customers, plus you have a lot of development over there that doesn't have fire protection. There are no hydrants or anything over there. And it would be good to get uh, fire protection to all that commercial development and everything over there. So we've been working on this a couple years. We were gonna come down Route 100, but now we're coming cross lots. Has, it's not cheaper, but we can pick up a couple of uh, Private public water systems, one of them is the mobile home park that has water quality <clears throat> issues, a couple of other smaller private systems and things. We think there's going to be about 80 customers we pick up. Um, it's kind of a pricey project. It's about $3 million. Um, we're going to be seeking grants. Um, what we don't want to do is fund a project where the existing users have to pay for it when they don't get any benefit. That we don't want to raise all the people's in the village rates just to get water up there. Um, but there's a big benefit to the town as a whole from fire protection and things that you get a lower insurance rate. The fire department uh, gets a higher rating because you have adequate fire flows and. All of the water storage that we have, the hydrants and everything are put in by the water users, but that no charge to the, to the town and things. So we think it's uh, 
a good project that the community benefits, the grand list of the town gets protected from fire protection and things. Um, and I think we've calculated, uh, Tom did some calculations. If we don't get any grant money and there's 80 users, it's about twenty. Seven hundred dollars a year. No, about about twenty two hundred a year. Yeah. Twenty two hundred dollars a year, which is pretty pricey on top of your water bill. So any grant money that we get would go to reducing that. We're also, you know, looking to apply at the state. They're talking about revolving loan funds rather than grants at this time and things. So we just want to put it back on the table. If we got 50% back from the 600,000 we turned back would be good. So um, anything is appreciated and uh, you know, we'll be working on this regardless of where you are. And it's, um, I think it's a really good project if we can um, pull it off. But we're going full steam ahead at this point to get plans in place if the state and feds have money for projects ready to go that um, we would jump on the bandwagon as soon as we can. So I'd answer any questions if you have any. But. Uh, you've got two uh, proposed routes here. One sort of goes straight through and the other sort of an alternative route. Well, I think there's, uh, Bill Woodruff could answer it better. Rather than using eight inch line to go over, there's an alternative for an inch and a half copper line to go feed um, a couple residents that wouldn't have the eight, full eight inch line to yeah, go you, there. You're just jumping off the eight inch going with inch and a half to service those. Yes. Yeah. Uh, have you already spoken with Landover? Do you yes, have Woody has talked to everybody. They're excited <laughs> to get rid of their ugly water in the <laughs> well they described and um, you know they're uh, you know willing to grant us a right away to go across and um, things so it's it's turning out to be a project people are looking forward to and things and there's a lot of uh, you know the uh, medical building in particular up in the development there really was excited about the possibility of getting water. I think they're one of the public water systems now that have to go through testing and everything that if they connected on us, they wouldn't have to do that. So, um, so anyway, you'll hear more about it regardless. Yeah. Thank, so, you, thank, thank you, Thank you for your time. All the other requests will probably be smaller. <laughs> Other, I don't see any on, no, on. We might need to prompt for what? these hands raised if you want that on Zoom. No, that's me. That's the, right. So if, if we're she, asking folks to raise their hands. Yeah. I'll take two Justin, minutes. Justin, want to come time. forward? Hi, guys. I'm Justin Blackman, chairman of the board of the Senior Center. Um, so as uh, everybody, I believe, knows, one of the main programs at the Senior Centre is the Meals on Wheels. Uh, we're currently operating from a kitchen uh, where all of the appliances were put in 25 years ago. Uh, we're aware that uh, although everything is working right now, um, we don't really look forward to, uh, to the time when that isn't, it isn't all working properly. Um, so I'd very much like the group to consider um, helping the senior centre to re-kit out uh, the kitchen with stove, uh, cooker and uh, the hood that goes over the, uh, over the stove uh, that, by the way, we're led to believe probably the current one would not meet code right now. Um, we don't have any particular numbers in mind, but in very, very rough numbers, uh, talking to a couple of restaurateurs, I know we're probably looking around about fifty thousand dollars to rekit um, and bring up to standard uh, what the senior centre would ideally need to help keep us going for those meals on wheels. Uh, any other detail I could provide or not? Is is the senior centre an independent nonprofit? Uh, who owns it? It's uh, it's uh, independent in, in, in all of those respects, yes. 
the space is uh, is rented uh, from Downstreet Housing. I was going to say the same the same organization that just got the approval uh, 51, 51 right. South Main, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. But and and so Downstreet Housing <coughs> owns the the facility. Yes, Simpson Graves. Uh, if I may, since we're internally starting the budget process, we've emailed and we're meeting soon. Yes, indeed. So, nice to meet you. Yeah. <laughs> um, could you tighten up that $50,000 estimate and get some formal numbers? Because even if there's no ARPA funding, there's the budget process coming up, and now's the time if you're going to ask for specific funding for something to get it on the radar We screen. can certainly look at that. We haven't done so far. It's been one of those things, uh, just kind of a little bit too big mm -hmm. a pipe dream to even think about too much. Uh, but yes, we can certainly work towards trying to get some better numbers on that. And then my, my other question is, if you, if you do these improvements, do you have to shut down for any period of time, do you think? Um, and how do you serve those people? So in, in the same way as a restaurant that might have to shut down for a, a small space of time, uh, we are already, we have emergency procedures, for instance, ice and snow. Um, we have a backlog of, I think it's somewhere near even, it's normally between six and 800 frozen meals able to, to get people looked after. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Anyone else would like to make a comment? Would you like to come forward? Yeah. I'm uh, Karen Walker Beecher at Stagecoach Lane, Waterbury Center. Um, so I don't have a specific request. It's more a question and a consideration. When I, <clears throat> when I read about the ARPA funds, I believe it's supposed to go towards people or municipalities or businesses that were hurt by the economic <coughs> impact of, <clears throat> excuse me, of the pandemic. And so I guess, are we thinking about that in terms of where this money is going? Because I think about in terms of the vitality of Waterbury, <clears throat> the businesses that have been hurt, the lack of labor that's available, which relates to you know, affordable housing, education, the impact to kids, childcare, um, things of that nature. <clears throat> and I didn't see a lot of that listed on the survey. And so I guess I just ask that we not lose our way here in terms of what this money was intended for and where it gets spent because it kind of feels like we got the lottery, we won the lottery and now we're just trying to figure out where to spend it and not really looking at the sustainability of Waterbury and the impact of the pandemic specifically. Just as a brief comment, it's not just the ARPA funds and not specifically folks that have been impact impacted directly mm -hmm. uh, it's the community has been impacted in many ways right. so a lot of you know you can't say like roads and infrastructure you know you know COVID didn't probably affect those things but it probably it affected the way the community was able to fund some of those projects along the last couple of years because of funding shortfalls so it's not just direct you know, you know, they have, what is it called, funds lost? Uh, I, I can clarify. If you, yeah. So when the, when the ARPA bills were initially passed, um, there was pretty strict categories upon which we could spend it. And, and what you talked about were within those categories. Right. Um, some months went by, and I think mostly out of practicality, the U.S. Treasury changed the rules. And they said, if you get 10 million or less, which is every municipality in Vermont except for Burlington, I think, um, you can declare a revenue loss. And then those categories become as broad as the ocean. So that being said, what you're talking about, I think, has a lot of merit, because you're talking about the original legislation and spirit of the bill. So, I, so what you're saying was indeed correct. Yeah. yeah, I'm just thinking in terms of you know, the impact to education, right? It's huge. It's going to take years to get caught, get back where we were. The impact to the labor market were right. massive. Right. Mm -hmm. So I just ask that you not lose sight of that in terms of how this money gets spent. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for your comments. Other comments? Don't be bashful, please. <laughs> 
on Zoom as well. You're invited to speak if you'd like. Again, we, you know, there are still surveys. Uh, please feel free to take one of the surveys and, uh, you know, we'd be glad to include information from everyone, you know, maybe tonight has inspired you to, to think of some other things that you might, you know, want to think of as inclusion. We don't want this to be a kind of top down. We want this to be a community minded project. Yeah, I think I want to piggyback what Alyssa said earlier yeah. um, <clears throat> in, a, in maybe a different way. Uh, the survey has, has an excellent job that was done with it because of maybe not losing people's interest and, and uh, going a bit too far with information. That's one of the things, it, it's short shortfall was that it didn't have a lot of information about anything that was put into it because of didn't want to get a stack of papers in the mail like this that you had to go through in order to fill out the survey. So that's kind of why you guys are here tonight to you know express any interest in any of those things that were there, maybe get questions answered and put forward any other ideas that perhaps you didn't see on paper. Uh, this is, uh, you know, I don't, know how lengthy this process is going to take. Uh, we want to kind of get the ball in motion on anything that we decide that we'd like to move forward with so that it doesn't, uh, you know, doesn't take forever to, to uh, take this money and put it to use. Uh, Thanks, Chris. Roger. Yeah, uh, well, I also want to uh, thank Tom for uh, compiling uh, the results uh, that we've come through both uh, on the uh, paper surveys that were mailed out. I think we received uh, over 300 of them. Uh, over 200. Over 200, over. okay. And then uh, an additional 200 or so uh, online. Uh, and uh, again, as Mike said, uh, any of you that haven't filled it out, we'd love to have you take one, fill it out now, or take it home, fill it out, and get it back to us. I think what we uh, were proposing was to present the results at our next board meeting, which is going to be uh, two weeks from tonight, uh, and sort of use that as at least one stop in the process of saying, okay, what, what is the public telling us about what the priorities are, and uh, we can make some decisions there, and we'll be getting into the budgeting process for 2023 uh, soon thereafter. And then following um, some, some projects may be put into that 2023 budget, but as Tom said, we have until 2024 to allocate the funds and 2026 to spend them. So just because something isn't in the budget for 23 doesn't mean it won't go into the, the following year's budget as a project because we do have through 24 to allocate the funds. I'll wrap it up. Any further comments? <laughs> Thank you so much for one Harry, thing. I, for one thing, if I may. Um, I would encourage the town to think a little bit about trying to get as shovel ready as you can on projects you might not have moved. <clears throat> um, for instance, uh, we know the Winooski Street Bridge is a problem hydraulically. Um, if the town took the initiative to do the kind of the scoping work that, that the state typically does when a project goes through their cycle, I think it'd be a lot closer for some of the monies that are coming down for various programs. ARPA is just a piece of it. The IIJA is also <coughs> very big. And so it might be an opportune time to take some of this money and try to move something, advance something that's bigger picture in hopes of being in a better position just a few years away. I know, speaking of the Winooski Bridge, I know there was a, a pretty hard look at that after the flood um, because that was the bottleneck that caused a lot of the flood. I think there's a lot of paperwork out there that says the span needs to double. Right? Yeah. Village floods in large part because of it. 
Yeah, and I, I forget the results of that study, but um, it's because of the elevation of that thing and how it bottlenecks down. It was, it would, <laughs> I know it was going to be very, very expensive to uh, correct that problem. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was, I do recall it being looked at pretty hard after mm -hmm. the flood because that was one of the main reasons that mm -hmm. the problems occurred that they did here in town. So. I will also share that Chris, Chris's observations on gravel are very real. It is a real substantial increase in future operating expenses for towns. Uh, and I agree with your 50-50 mix. Yeah. Uh, that's pretty much what we do. We're fortunate in Stowe to have a pit up in Nebraska Valley. Uh, it is not an unlimited resource, and we process material to make our gravel. Um, and, uh, but I know what other towns are dealing with, and trucking long distances is a whole different realm of expense. And we may be wanting to pave Little Meadow Road just to not have more gravel to maintain. Yeah. So I don't know if you, how well you know Harry. He's oh, yeah, actually, sir, can we get your name for the record? Yes, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm Harry Shepard, uh, Jenny Davis Road. <laughs> so, he, the Public Works Director, right, Harry? Yes, in yeah. Stowe. Yes. Oh, so, yeah. so. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, Harry. Thanks, and then, Mike, you have somebody on Zoom also. Okay, that's uh, Cindy Parks. Would you go? Hi, everyone. Uh, Cindy Parks, I live on Kennedy Drive. I'm here as a private citizen, not as an e flood commissioner. Uh, I just was curious, I noticed the gravel reference in the uh, questionnaire, and I just wondered, um, has there been an evaluation of a projection as to how long our current resources are going to last, and what resources we, we need for the town moving forward? I know that for stormwater control, there's a lot more emphasis on using rock dams now. Um, so I just would like to know a little bit more about the gravel identification. Um, Tom, Tom Chris. I'm gonna have to get back to you because it's a new issue to us. We only recently found out that our current source is no longer selling us gravel. Okay. Um, so that's that's the real challenge. It's It's unfortunately that We've got um, a stockpile for now, um, but it's not going to last very long, as I understand it. And so we're going to have to take the winter and, and figure out that plan. But we can get back to you on that. Sorry, I don't have a better answer. Okay. Oh, that's all right. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Maybe we could buy some gravel from Nebraska Valley. <laughs> <laughs> Harry might be able to help us. <laughs> yeah. Any, anyone else? private folks spent part of their Monday to come sit in this room. I mean, we'd love to have you every week. Don't get us wrong. <laughs> Attendance is always welcome, but really, I'm just. Yeah, this is, this is your meeting to make comments to help us direct the municipality on what the residents feel are priorities. And the ones that we've heard already have been good, and the ones that we've heard uh, electronically <laughs> and by mail have been good. So we need to synthesize you know, what the community's wishes, but we would love to hear. If anyone who hasn't spoken, we would love to hear from you. Monica. Thanks for having us, I appreciate that. Um, Monica Callen, Sweet uh, Farm Road. Um, I got a couple of things that I'd like to just sort of put out there to see if they're possible. Um, a pedestrian bike path from Waterbury to Waterbury Center connecting these two parts of our community. I think they, it, it would be great to be able to um, access them by all ages and all capabilities um, and not just by vehicles. Um, another one is public art projects. As um, an artist and a, um, I, I, just, I have to put that out there, and as a, um, a Vermont Creative Network zone agent, that's something that um, I can talk at length mm -hmm. in if you want to hear about it. Um, and about the benefits. Um, uh, I'd love to also see um, safe walking and biking paths on Maple Street um, and around the center, especially um, down. I see a lot of people walking um, down to the reservoir, <coughs> and it'd be great to have um, safer access to those resources. Um, 
uh, and support for businesses in Waterbury Center to come back so that um, that can be another little hub of activity in Waterbury. That's Thank you. Yeah. Do you have any, any numbers for any of those projects? No. I, 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 I said just, maybe the public yeah. arts project you might have had something. I don't have them in my pocket, okay. but I, I can draw them up if you're looking for one. <laughs> Thank you. That would be helpful, Monica. Okay. Thanks. Do you have something, Roger? I was just going to ask, um, because there is a, a path that runs uh, from the golf course uh, into the village. Uh, to, to the uh, park and ride. Yeah, to the park and ride on Lincoln Street Extension. So I was just wondering if uh, Monica was thinking about something to connect to that path. Piggy tail on both ends there, probably, yeah. Mm -hmm. I assume so, because I know, the, I know the Conservation Commission, we were involved in c helping clear that. And I know it's used by people. It's a great place to walk, mm -hmm. bike, et cetera. Yeah. Unfortunately, I just uh, was speaking to an uh, employee of the golf course. I don't know if anybody has witnessed the pillars they put at the bottom of the, mm. yeah. they're okay. actually putting a gate up to uh, mm. prevent the uh, sliders from sliding on the hill or parking up above uh, because they're doing damage to the greens and stuff, uh, lighting fires, put, having fires on the, on the property and, and huh. impacting. So now, yeah. I was wondering so, what was going on. Yeah, there. unfortunately. Yeah, so the kids will have to find another place. They to put out an email about winter use. Like, I think if you request permission, they put out <coughs> something on Front Porch Forum, and you can email them to request permission for winter use. So I think so, they're trying to find a balance of allowing yeah. but keeping track so that okay. if some damage happens. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. so that's probably why they want uh, permission mm -hmm. use. Yeah. Thanks. Anyone else? Yeah. If not, anyone else on Zoom? There being none, we will close the discussion on offer funds. Again, still feel free, take a survey, let us know what your thinking is. You know, we'll be making some more decisions at our next select board meeting. Thank you all for coming. Thank yeah, you all thank for you. coming. <laughs>
and, and you can't quote me 100% on this because I'm not exactly sure how it plays into the whole budgetary process, but they were looking to, uh, to try to show that they're doing something. They were looking to uh, have the uh, Wastefield kitchen rebuilt at a half a million dollars. Uh, <coughs> Waitsfield School gets their meals from Faston. They're made in Faston and brought to Waitsfield and served there. Uh, so there was some heated discussion about this proposal for half a million dollars. Uh, and, and I know that the young man that uh, the board recommended to the school board um, at first couldn't see a problem with spending the half a million dollars, but after some time had passed and he got a little bit deeper into the process of being a school board member, he started to realize, you know, this, this might not be a good idea. Uh, so my concern is, and I'm just putting this to the board, as I had said before, the reason I didn't vote for Jake wasn't because of Jake. It was because it seems as though our school board process is just really, really broken. And I don't believe that the taxpayers are being served by it the way they should be. And I know there's probably nothing that we can do, maybe perhaps other than speak to our representatives. I think it's time to consider a restructuring process of the school board itself. Whether, you know, how can 14 people not get anything done? I mean, you, it's difficult to come to any consensus when you've got that many people on the board. Now, whether downsizing the board to something like we have here, whether it be one representative per town, I know it's all based on population and yada, 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 but it's broken and broken severely uh, and the public's not being served. Well, we have seen that from the multiple representatives that we have had from our community mm -hmm. have all, they're on and then they're off. Yeah. And that, that to me says volumes. And that's, I, and that's continuing. Yeah. I would love to think about um, a couple of really logistical things. We see the turnover and that says something. Right. Yet, I'm not sure many or any of us attend school board meetings. I've only been to two ever, so <laughs> I speak for myself too. That's, I've only been to two. Mm -hmm. um, if we're concerned, I think we wanna be very careful not to try to make decisions or, or suggestions based on hearsay. Right. Not that I doubt someone telling the truth, but someone telling someone telling someone is not a way to make you know municipal decisions, especially when it's sort of outside of our. So I, I would propose if there are concerns as a board and or as individuals, we attend meetings, um, gather some facts and information. When broad statements are said like they're not getting anything done, I'm curious what, what facts can we look at? What were some proposals over the past two to five years that are not following through? What, are they, what can they show of having accomplished in those years? Um, so before I think suggestions or, or you know, big um, conversations are had, I think it would behoove concerned parties, whether it's individuals or the entire board, to, to work on finding facts, data, um, and or being there firsthand. Yeah. Um, so that's my only. Yep. I, I agree with you, Danny. Uh, I, I've attended several school <laughs> board meetings, and I've never seen a more dysfunctional group than the school board. I, I, I'm I wanna, I'm sorry, I'm Mike, I'm really there. sorry to interrupt you. I just, it, you're entitled to your opinion. It rubs me That's a little bit a wrong way to say that in a public meeting that school board members might watch. I would be really upset if someone said that about me and our board. You can still say it. I'm not censoring your language. I'm, sure I'm just saying. Like, and that's where I was going. Yeah. I said that's my personal observation, and maybe there so, have been other yeah. other so, things. But we have we have planned to have the superintendent to meet with us, and I think that's mm -hmm. the, yeah. that's where we need to 
next meeting. Well, I think Danny's right. suggestion is, and I'd love to attend a couple of meetings yeah. with you. Yeah, yeah. If, you know, this was a starting point for me mm -hmm. because I'm hugely concerned. We're looking at an 8% increase in our education taxes this year. You know, it's how much longer before any of us here say, I just can't do it here no more. Mm -hmm. You know, that's one of my biggest fears. That's yeah. what I tried to convey to Dean Salvas here tonight was that, you know, that's why I got on the board is because that was my biggest fear is being shoved out of the town that I've been here forever. In, you know, in, in my last days, and, and that's just wrong. Uh, so, you know, to, to suggest me to, as a select board member to suggest should the board think about doing something about school board, that's how concerned I am for all of us. You know, it's just that and other issues, the drug problem in yeah. our own town. You know, maybe I'm stepping beyond my bounds, but it's because I give a damn about where we're headed. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I have attended school board mm -hmm. meetings. You know, I've seen the same thing that Mike has seen, but I'm willing to yeah. certainly go again if that's, yeah. if that, you know, this is a starting point for yeah. me to say, I, I see, a, to me, I see a problem and what can we do as a select board to mm -hmm. either point somebody else in the direction of fixing it or putting pressure, right. us putting pressure on somebody to, and that's where a, a two-way conversation with yeah. us and the superintendent, that's where we have to go. You know, I, I just get concerned that they're more concerned with process and stuff, stuff than sometimes substance. And that's where I find Sorry. a problem. Or is it? No, I think I just, along the same lines, as a person on a volunteer representative board, I think it's, I want to give everyone the benefit of the doubt just because I know the outside perception of oh, the yeah. work we all do. I think we all really care about Waterbury and come to these meetings and work really hard and do our best to spend our volunteer time making the community a better place and what it looks like from the outside. I don't know now <laughs> being on the inside and maybe it's not always pretty, but I was just going to say I appreciate the point that at the last meeting we decided to invite, invite Dr. Yeah. Mike, who's the new superintendent, so that's a point of conversation and I would echo I have not been to school board meetings, so yeah. again, personally, I would not want to do anything. And then I also would just want to know more about what the relationship between a select board and a school board is. I hear you, Chris, if it reaches a certain point and maybe the board should be attached you know i will say candidly in the past we've said on your municipal property bill did you look at the point portion that was local because that's us and the rest isn't us and um i think once you start diving into that realm i do think you kind of lose that and so i just also want to think carefully about i don't think we have everything solved on just the local level in terms of issues we can topic and make sure we're taking care of our own house first before we're running yeah. around and, and critiquing yeah. other yeah. volunteer boards. Tom, do you have any kind of where, how, the one thing I know the select board does is we will recommend, you know, people who they've put up for, you know, for, for, for a seat, seat on, the, on the school board. Is there any other that the select board, because I don't see there's a lot Kind of, they're kind of their own thing. If, if they're I'm, the governing body, right? They're a governing body of the school systems. We're a governing body of the municipality. It seems like the conversation with the superintendent is the great right. step, and then he might be the person to ask for advice, right? Exactly. The, the other piece I'll say about school taxes this year <laughs> is, last year the state used COVID funds mm -hmm. to buy down the education tax rate. I. I forget how much, but I'll thumb my head. I think it was something like five cents. Yeah. Um, so you're probably going to see that increase regardless of anything else. Because my understanding is that was one-time money. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know what the increase will be. The other piece that uh, people should know is about the education finance piece is schools pass their budgets, but they don't. The state sets the tax rates, and that's pretty complex. So they don't actually right. know the impact their budget on the tax rate, and that's vastly different from us. Mm -hmm. uh, so sometimes mm -hmm. they can cut their budget, and it seems incongruous with what you see in your bill. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that input, Roger. Um, this is a little bit beside the point that uh, Chris brought up, but uh, we did uh, last time uh, talk about uh, asking Mike. Uh, if uh, he would be able to consider closing 
schools on voting mm -hmm. day. And I was wondering if that was communicated to him, uh, and if not. So I haven't had a conversation with him, but on that issue and other issues, um, if anyone has specific uh, questions they, they would like answered, just give them to me and I can talk to him before the meeting and okay. he can get prepared. Oh, Consider that was particularly important to me, so I would just <laughs> <understand. laughs> seems I like you're a you're good, good idea. So I've heard. <laughs> As the former PE teacher, also very important. To me. Especially when they could move the in-service day, which is usually Mike, the don't go there. Don't go. There. <laughs> school and here, like the chatter was just too high. Yeah, they had an in-service day for you. It will be addressed. Um, before you, are you, I have one thing I want to just bring up to you. I don't know if you made a decision tonight, but the January meeting is on a day when we are closed. Oh yeah. So just to look ahead at the January calendar, um, not necessarily tonight, but maybe next week. How about the following Tuesday? Uh, Bill has advised me that you usually meet every Monday. Every Monday. Every January. Monday. Sounds oh, like a super fun. Good yeah, sorry. Time. Yep. Um, you do a planning commission meeting the following Monday, so I assume I'll work with Steve to get those rescheduled. Um, so, so he wasn't sure if you uh, had a desire to meet on Monday, regardless of this, the office being open, or on Tuesday, or how you wanted to handle that first week. Because the, the second, second is the observed, observed the holiday. holiday. Right, so our office is actually closed on, on Monday, the second. So again, you don't have to answer tonight. We can talk about it at the next meeting. I can talk about this little schedule if you want. It just shows what this in this room. Um, yeah. Just have it on the radar. Okay. Does it work for everyone to just uh, move, get the, move it to the following day? To the two, Tuesday? The third. I can yeah. do the third. Yes, You're the boss. I'm not the boss, but uh, <laughs> one of the bosses. <laughs> um, I, 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 that would be my suggestion. Just uh, on Jump days where we're closed on Monday, just move it to Tuesday. Typically, we do do that. Right. So, and I don't see, and I, and I think I think we can skip that yeah, meeting. There's nothing that, else that, uh, on Tuesday. There's there's nothing in this room on Tuesday the third, okay. so that one's fairly easy. If that's what okay. the decision is. Let's try that. Okay. And then, do you intend to meet every Monday starting? Yeah. Yes. And if we don't meet it, great. We'll celebrate. Yeah. But. Let the fun begin. <laughs> We budgets, budget season. Work, budget meetings are, we're well into it internal, so it'll be fun. It will. Thank you. It's so good to hear that. Fun. We're looking yeah. forward to it. We're glad the optimism. Thank you. Well, who enjoys this work. Okay, now there is a um, section for manager's item that uh, we need to go into executive session. Involving the uh, performance and pay of an individual. So I think we Was do need Bill to want to be here for that, or is that not the case? He right. doesn't have it? to be. Okay. okay. Not yet. All right. Uh, I move that we move go into executive session. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion on that? If not, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passes. <laughs>